Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gersh1, and today we're going to be talking about the Eldar. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40K lore videos every single day. If you have any suggestions, please comment down below. And if you enjoy our content, thank our patrons on Patreon. It's because of them that we can do this. Link in the description if you guys want to support us. But with that said, let's get into 40 Facts on the Eldar Craft Worlds. In the time leading up to the Great Fall, each Eldar homeworld of the Empire created a gigantic starship, sung from Wraithbone and so massive as to be nearly a planetoid itself. The last uncorrupted individuals from each world were loaded onto these ships, along with works of art, plant life, and animals, all that could be saved. In these craft worlds, as they came to be known, the final Eldar exodus began, and only barely in time. The psychic shockwave of Slaanesh's birth in the 30th millennium caught some of the craft worlds and destroyed them, while others were pulled into the orbit against their will around the Eye of Terror. The craft world's population probably composed the majority of the surviving Eldar race, although it is impossible to say just how many individuals this was. The craft worlds are certainly the seat of the remaining Eldar industries, technology, and culture, as they contain only a part of their original homeworld civilization. Most of the craft worlds contain special biodomes that house plants and wildlife from the original homeworld of the craft worlds of people, and those are carefully tended to. Although each craft world is essentially independent in its actions and governance, they will generally offer and accept aid and advice from one another. Although not common, sometimes craft worlds disagreement will cause two to clash on the field of battle, though this is always a last resort. Every craft world contains an infinity circuit, which is essentially the wraithbone skeleton of the craft world itself. Within this matrix called the infinity circuit, the souls of all the craft worlds dead resides in a form of group consciousness, providing both a well of psychic power for the ship and a massive ancestral mind to advise and guide the living. The infinity circuit is the closest thing that the Eldar now have as an afterlife, for if their souls are not captured at death and integrated into the infinity circuit, they will be lost in the warp and devoured by Slaanesh. For this reason, the Eldar will defend their craft worlds with a fury that is almost unrivaled among sentient species. They risk losing not only their home, but the souls of their ancestors as well. The Eldar hope that one day, when the last Eldar soul is placed within the craft world's collective infinity circuit, they will unite into a new Eldar god known as Ined, the god of rebirth, who will fight and overthrow Slaanesh. It is a faint hope, but the only hope that the Eldar now possess for their dwindling race. The Eldar craft world of Saimhan was reputedly one of the first craft worlds to abandon the Crone worlds as the fall of the Eldar approached, heeding their Farseer's warning. As such, they have spent much more time isolated from the rest of the Eldari than other major craft worlds, although the Saimhan do maintain contact with and have cultural ties to the exodited worlds. Like most Eldari, the craft world of Saimhan is filled with fierce warriors who place honor at a higher value than their more culturally sophisticated kin. Unfortunately, this ferociousness combined with their pride has led them into conflict with each other and different craft worlds. While this generally takes the form of a highly ritualized duel in which first blood is usually sufficient enough to end the matter, the occasional deaths from these conflicts has led to the barbaric reputation of the craft world among other Eldari. Saimhan is also well known for their jet bike riding warriors, the clans of the Wild Riders. They are renowned for their savagery and their preference for fast mobile warfare, striking like a serpent before falling back beyond the reach of retaliation. Almost every member of Saimhan is part of a Wild Rider family, including its seers. This allows them to field many specialists who ride jet bikes and vipers. The Eldar jet bike is a sleek, one-man craft propelled by powerful anti-gravitic motors. Beautifully designed, the Eldar jet bike is a wonder of engineering, using subtle manipulation of anti-gravity fields to combine high speed with incredible agility and maneuverability. It is capable of such velocity that without the superhuman reaction speed of an Eldar, it would be more lethal to the rider than its foe. So finely created are these incredible machines that a skilled pilot 
can cross leagues in just a few heartbeats before leveling a hurricane of close-range shuriken fire into the enemy ranks. Retaliation is almost impossible, for the jet bike is agile enough to bear its pilot away into cover. Jet bikes can even be used to climb the sides of buildings, using their powerful anti-gravitic technology. To an Eldar, the mastery of a jet bike is an exhilarating challenge. They have long, curved veins on either side that allow the rider to execute incredibly sharp turns in mid-air, and the strength of their anti-grav motors can be subtly manipulated to send the jet bike hurling into a steep dive or sharp climb. Even for an Eldar, it takes years of practice to master a jet bike's potential, but one who does builds a rapport with a steed comparable to the horse masters of Eldar mythology. Guardians who pilot Eldar jet bikes into battle are known as Wind Riders. These Wind Rider jet bike squads are often amongst the vanguard of the Eldar war hosts, where their speed and agility make them ideal scouts and hunters. Such is the skill of the Wind Riders that they think little of darting through the thick trees of jungle or dodging down the rubble choked streets of a ruined city. Foes will often not hear the whine of the jet bike's engine until the craft has flashed past and can only watch uselessly as the Eldar slipped swiftly out of reach. As hunters, the Wind Riders are equally skilled, circling above like birds of prey as their enemies scrabble in the dirt below. At breakneck speeds, they hurtle down, guns blazing before peeling away once more. It is this affinity to the jet bike, and a military innovation pioneered by the artisans of Saim Han, that created the Vipers. Vipers are two-seated attack craft capable of mounting a variety of heavy weapons. While the Viper's pilots steer the craft through clouds of incoming fire with all the grace and skill expected of a wind rider, the rear-seated gunner effortlessly swings the turret heavy weapon at the skimmer's rear to select and destroy potential targets. Vipers mount a fearsome array of weapons, shuriken cannons, and scatter lasers to scythe down ranks of their foe. Their relatively small size means that they can travel through all but the thinnest webway paths, and their armaments enable them to rival many tanks in the terms of firepower. Together, Vipers have the speed and firepower to deal with any threat, and there is no better Wind Rider Jet Bike Squad or Viper Squad than those formed by the families of Simon Craft World. These families are maintained in a feudal hierarchy, ruled over by an Eldar chieftain, and his rule is passed down through hereditary traditions. The chieftain's closest family form his kinsmen, who paint their faces with hot blood on the eve of conflict, drink from each other's wrists, and ride to war together as brothers. In much the same way, each unit of jet bikes or viper pilots is comprised of blood relatives and tend to sport a vivid banner showing their clan's rune. Unlike other craft worlds who unite in mass mobilization, the Saim Han kindreds are each free to choose whether or not to fight in defense of a particular cause. Disagreements on military matters are usually resolved with ritual combat between champions chosen from within the kindreds. However, it is not unknown for a kindred to go to war without the assistance, let alone the approval, of the rest of the craft world. The Saim Han war hosts are generally red or a light scarlet color. They are often highlighted with contrasting shades mainly black, white, or yellow, in striped patterns. They also use simple chevrons or stripe motifs on their vehicles as a form of status identifier. Saim Han's warrior clans have their own varying personal symbols, so there is almost certain to be a significant amount of variation between the clans, squads, or even individuals. For the most part, the craft world's rune is a stylized serpent, which is the cosmic serpent of the Eldari myth. This Eldar myth states that the serpent is the only creature believed to exist in both the material and the psychic universe at the same time. Hence, the serpent is said to know all the secrets, past and present. Saim Han means quest for enlightenment, for in the Eldari lexicon, the word for snake and secret knowledge is identical, Saim. The serpent iconography is so revered by the Saim Han Eldari that one of their coming-of-age rites is to catch a dagger snake in mid-strike, found on many worlds within the Exodites. The serpent also epitomizes the attack style of the Saim Han, a fast, deadly strike before withdrawing, leaving the enemy panicking and confused. The ferociousness of the Saim Han craft world can best be understood 
during an event recorded in Imperial Records known as the Cruel Thirst, when the Slaneshi demon prince Lilesh Snerlas masterminded a vast demonic incursion across a score of Imperial worlds near the Moon of Nightmares. The Eldar of Saimhan responded with focus aggression, unwilling to permit such a foray into the material plane so near to their craft world. Over the course of five years, the riders of Saimhan systematically outmaneuvered and exterminated those loyal to the court of Slanesh. Eventually, Saimhan's high chieftain, not who, brought Lilish Snerlas to battle at the demon stronghold, the so-called Sanctuary of Sins. Those Snerlas lethal handmaidens attempted to intervene, not who's jet by kindreds kept them at bay with volleys of shuriken catapult fire. Leaping from the back of his jet bike, not who plunged the legendary celestial lance into the demon's heart, shattering its soul and banishing its essence to hell from which it came. Those Laneshi demons that remained, and the chaos worshipping humans that were in league with them, were mercilessly destroyed. Almost a millennia later, the Imperium got another taste of Craftworld Saimhan in an event known as the Death of Gnosis Prime. The Imperial planet of Gnosis Prime was invaded by the Eldari after a territorial dispute of epic proportions. Despite having settled the planet some 1200 years previous, the human inhabitants were given an ultimatum by Eliac Cypherblade of Saim Han, eviction or die. The Otark's demands were met with an extremely vulgar response, as the Eldari forces were outnumbered a hundred times over by the Imperial army, but the vengeful Cypherblade made the ocean his landing zone before running rings around the military juggernaut of the Imperium with his Windriders. He crippled the planet's industrial zone and systematically eradicated billions of Imperial citizens. A full year after the start of the war, Wolf Lord Logan Grimnar of the Space Wolves chapter arrived on Gnosis system. When they found the doomed world, it was all but a graveyard. The Great Wolf vowed if he could not save the people of Gnosis Prime, he would avenge them. And so, he set course for Gnosis Segundus, seeking revenge against the Saimhan Eldar still in system. At the height of the battle, Grimnar faked a looming defeat in order to draw the arrogant Eldar commander into battle. Though the two mighty warriors clashed blades, Grimnar was unable to take full advantage after knocking the Altark off his jet bike by smashing his engine core with the axe of Morkai. The Great Wolf could only howl in frustration as the Altark nimbly pulled himself up onto a passing skimmer. The two exchanged a final look through the rain as the Eldar fell back through a webway portal. Though the Space Wolves had emerged victorious, it was a hollow victory as the Gnosis system lay in ruin while the Eldar had escaped, at least for now. Ulthway whose full name is actually Ulthana Shelway, which means the Song of Ulthanash in the Eldar Lexicon, is one of the largest remaining Eldar craft worlds that survived the fall of the Eldar. During the fall of the Eldar, the lamentable event that heralded the birth of the Dark Prince Lanash, Ulthway was caught in the pull of the Eye of Terror. Here it has remained for millennia, trapped where the Immaterium intersects with real space. It is a breeding ground for chaos and a gateway into the warp. Due to this baleful proximity to the eye, Ulthway must be on constant high alert in case of attacks by the forces of chaos. Constant risk and warfare has hardened this craft world citizens to hardship. Due to the lack of the aspect warriors on the craft world, Ulthway maintains a standing militia known as the Black Guardians, who are highly skilled and better trained than the guardians of other craft worlds. Craft world Ulthway is home to many of the most powerful psychers in the galaxy. The Eldar of Ulthway cast themselves as sentinels, keeping an endless vigil over this dreaded gulf. There, elite cadres of Farseers keep watch for the many and varied guises of chaos, for Ulthway's many talented psychics can foresee future events with a great precision than those of other craft worlds. This foresight has allowed them both to preserve their line and thwart their eternal enemies the forces of the great enemy. Ulthway uses such future knowledge often to the detriment of other races, always acting to preserve the Eldar, whatever the cost. Due to the craft world's close proximity to the eye, Ulthway maintains a large number of warlocks, 
though others believe it is because their location causes exaggerated psychic powers in the Ulthwe population that results in the emergence of more warlocks. Whatever the reason, many warlocks, seers, and other psychic warriors follow the Ulthwe armies to battle, and their psychic skills are even more advanced than those found on other craft worlds, as they are able to see the skies of fate further and farther ahead in time with greater precision. One of the most famous and integral aspects of the Ulthwe craft world is its seer council. Formerly led by the now deceased Eldred Ulthran, the council both overtly and secretively interferes with other races in an attempt to steer fate in their favor. This has no doubt allowed the Ulthwe craft world to survive so long in such a perilous position. At the behest of the council, the craft world's warriors are often sent into apparently unrelated battles that will ultimately concern Ulthwe itself. It is largely through these seeming the farseers of Ulthwe know well that stopping the fall of a single stone can sometimes prevent an avalanche, and they manipulate fate itself in order to avert disaster. After all, the seers of Ulthwe would rather see a hundred thousand humans perish than a single Eldar life slip away. Through its interference with other races, Ulthwe is supposedly responsible for several devastating events in the Imperium of Man's history, including the Second War for Armageddon, the Sanapin Scouring, the Mortis Annihilation, and the Third Coming of Orion. Yet they have also made powerful allies within the Imperium, such as the ancient and wealthy House Belisarius of Terra, one of the families of the Novice Nobilites, having saved this house of Navigator's fortune and honor in times long past. The House of Belisarius then forged the Pact of Anwin with the Eldar of Ulthwe, agreeing to repay their debt seven times by coming to the aid of Ulthwe whenever it's requested. In the 10,000 Terran years since the Pact, the House of Belisarius has been called to repay five of the seven debts. As a consequence of having more psychers than other craft worlds, it has few aspect warriors instead relying heavily upon standing armies of citizen troops known as Black Guardians. These fearless soldiers hold back the advance of the Chaos Hordes in a hundred different locations, striking with serpentine swiftness from hidden webway portals across the Segmentum Obscurus. Supporting these troops are an assortment of vehicles and elite units armed and equipped with advanced Eldar technology. Ulthwe also employs a large number of psychers on the battlefield, sometimes in the form of seer councils, consisting of multiple farseers and warlock bodyguards. The seer council, or seers, will use their potent powers to destroy the minds of their enemies, shape the battle's course to their favor, and perform other tasks to ensure their victory. However, every time the seer or warlock delves into the warp to harness its powers to their favor, they risk their own minds. Many have been lost to the terrors of the warp. Ulthwe armies may strike fast and hard in the form of an Ulthwe strike force, a highly mobile unit of Ulthwe power in which units are highly mobilized by utilizing jet bikes and other fast vehicles, which enable the force to strike quickly and decisively through the webway gates and vanish as quickly as they appeared. The sight of an Ulthwe force is a brooding dark image filled with the air of mourning and suffering. Ulthwe's force main color is an ominous black and most Ulthwe vehicles and warrior armor is this color. This is often contrasted with spotted colors and patterns of bone white, golden yellow, and dark red. It is whispered by those of other craft worlds that the Eldar of Ulthwe have been damned by their proximity to the Eye of Terror, exaggerating their psychic potential. Those of Ulthwe know instead they are the bulwark between the survival of their race and utter destruction. This craft world's world rune, the Eye of Isha, symbolizes the sorrow of Isha, the fertility goddess from whom the Eldar believe they descended. Isha, it is said, wept bitterly when Azuran, the king of the gods, ordered her separation from her mortal children. The god Vol forged her tears into glittering spirit stones so that her grief might not be in vain. Today the warriors of Ulthwe bear this symbol as their sigil, a reminder of the godhood they lost long ago. 
Valtan is the most martial and aggressive of the Eldar craft worlds. The people of Valtan constantly strive to return the ancient Eldar Empire to its former glory. Consumed with bitterness, they wage an endless campaign of xenocide against those foolish enough to cross their path. Valtan's story begins with the fall of the Eldar, the dying days of the Eldar Empire, when the monstrous birth of Slaanesh shattered their civilization. Having barely survived, the Eldar of Baitan refused to despair. Soon after, they joined Craftworld Yande's cause. For thousands of years, Yandan and Baltan fought as inseparable allies, their distant Craftworlds united by the common goal of defeating Chaos. As Baltan purged the western arm, so did Yandan drive the forces of Chaos from the eastern rim tirelessly defending the Exodites and Maiden worlds they hoped would one day form the heart of a new civilization. Then came the Tyranids. Yandin had encountered such creatures before, but those had only been tendrils of the hive mind's awareness, groping blindly through space. Now Yandin stood exposed before the onset of the entire hive fleet. In their pride, the Eldar of Yandin underestimated the threat they believed that their might could weather even this storm, and their armies and fleets could vanquish the Great Devourer. Alas, they were terribly wrong. In a blink of an eye, Yandin's craft world was reduced to ruin, abandoned by Baltan, whose own dream of an empire reborn was not in danger, so they did nothing. Each craft world carries the seeds of Eldar culture. Not all are identical by any means as each reflects the cultural heritage of its long-dead Eldar world of origin. For the Eldar of Baltan, the Way of the Warrior, the life stage that encompasses the aspect warriors of the Eldar, is considered the first step upon the path of the Eldar. Upon reaching physical maturity, a Baltan Eldar becomes an aspect warrior, and only once he has fulfilled this role can he continue along the path. As a result of this cultural predesignation, the Baltan craft world is famous for the militant and aggressive warrior ways of its Eldar population, and for the large number of aspect warriors it maintains, who often incorporate the traditional green and white colors of the craft world into their armor, as well as the colors of their aspect. The Eldar of Baltan have a strong martial honor code and believe that the best way to die is in battle fighting the enemies of Baltan. The Eldar of Baltan are honorable warriors who have taken it upon themselves to rebuild the lost glory of the ancient Eldar Empire through the destruction of the lesser races like mankind and the orcs who have usurped the galaxy and they believe it is glorious to die fighting the enemies of the craft world and the Eldar people. At the center of Baltan is the Chamber of Heroes where the spirit stone of dead aspect warriors are placed. Farseers often come to this chamber to consult the dead of the craft world on their proposed course of action. The dead of particular battles that the warriors of Baltan participate in are arranged together and are often referred to by the name of the battle in which they fell. For example, the dead of Koros fell fighting the forces of chaos on the ancient Eldar colony world, also by the same name. As the Eldar of Baltan see it, when the time comes for the Eldar to reclaim what is rightfully theirs, the paradise made in worlds and the planets of the Exodites will be the first staging points for their conquest. Due to this, the Baltan Eldar see any colonization by any other race of these worlds as a threat to the future growth of the reborn Eldar Empire. The incautious explorators of the Imperium have often made planetfall on an exodited world, only to have their successors find nothing but corpses that have been hacked to pieces and subsequently picked clean by indigenous scavengers. Details of the first encounter between the Imperium of Man and the Biotan craft world are fragmented at best. While it is likely that the forces of the God Emperor encountered Baltan forces during the Great Crusade in the 30th millennium, the first formal detailed encounter was in the late 32nd millennium. 
An Adeptus Mechanicus Explorator fleet was in the process of settling the uninhabited world of Garvis Minor when they came under attack. The Archeo Xenos team had barely begun to unearth alien architecture when the Eldar assaulted with inhuman ruthlessness. The startled adept sent a desperate cry for help before all communication was lost. In accordance with their settlement schedule, the Explorator team had built several preliminary fortifications. However, under the ferociousness of the assault, such meager preparations proved useless and they were forced to retreat back to their landing craft in the hope of withdrawal. Deadly Xeno's weapons and highly specialized warriors slaughtered the fleet and their Skatari protectors in a carefully planned and meticulous orchestrated attack. The landing craft that escaped the planet found the fleet burning in orbit, slaughtered by the swift Eldar attack craft. Their ship crippled and without warp capabilities, the explorators that had survived were abandoned to their fate, the Eldar leaving as swiftly as they had arrived. The only communication given by the Eldars Throughout the incident was an ominous broadcast delivered to the floundering landers. The soil of this planet is not for your feet to tread. Only death awaits you here. When elements of the Imperial Navy arrived to investigate, only one of the Explorator crafts remained, drifting lifelessly amongst the molten wreckage of the settlement fleet, its crew long since starved of both food and oxygen. Reviewing the vid logs and Vox recordings, Admiral Kixlick ordered all Imperial vessels out of the area before marking the planet with warning buoys, declaring the planet unsuitable for settlement. Accurate records of the episode of Garvis Minor have long since been sealed by the Ordo Xenos, though it is interesting to note that despite four subsequent settlement attempts by explorator teams, Garvis Minor remains a contested world and bears the same sanction as given by Admiral Kixlick a thousand years ago. When the Eldar of Baltan go to war, they assemble the Bas Kakain. In the Eldar lexicon, this term defines their assembled war host. Translated literally, the term could be constructed to mean sword wind, tempest of blades, or even frozen leaves and falling to cuts. The term sword wind is also the name given to the manner in which the Baltan wage war, a single attack that relies on the immense fighting skills and overwhelming firepower of its aspect warriors to annihilate the enemy in one swift blow. The Baltan therefore make expert use of the speed and maneuverability of their craft worlds complement of wave serpents and falcon grav tanks to move its units into position, from which the aspect warriors then launch a devastating all-out attack, smashing into the enemy and giving them no chance to recover. The Sword Winds Court's battle colors are green and white, often with flowing vines painted on bile tan vehicles. Each thorn of these vines represents the death of a hated enemy at the hands of the vehicle's pilots. This kind of attack has proven particularly devastating against the Sword Wind's favored type of target, enemy colonies. The Biotan see any colonization by other races as a threat to the future growth of the Eldar Empire. The Orcs in particular are hated by the Biotan, as they can rapidly spread across a colonized world. The starships of Biotan hunt across the stars to destroy Orc spacecrafts, such as Orc Rocks before they can find a world to engulf with the tide of green warriors. There have been many accounts through the millennia of the Biotan Eldar arriving to help a beleaguered Imperial garrison fighting against the Orcs, only for the Aspect Warriors to turn on their allies when the Orcs have been destroyed. The technology employed by the Biotan Craftworld is as advanced as that of any other Craftworld. It can be argued that the Biotan is considered most terrifying because of the diverse weapons and equipment they employ in the different units of Aspect Warriors. The Swordwind possesses a vehicle that is unique to the Eldar of Biotan. It is a super heavy gravity tank called a Void Spinner, which is armed solely with a huge monofilament cannon, 
which works just like any other Eldar monofilament weapon, except that it incorporates a techno virus that sterilizes the ground that it touches, killing any orc spores that are released during the slaughter. Even the most basic weapon in the Eldar arsenal is of a technological level incomparable to the solid and dependable weaponry of the Imperial Guard, and arguably the equal of the bolters wielded by the Adeptus Astartes. The name of the Biltan Craftworld is a variation of the ancient Celtic holiday of Beltan, also known as Beltane or in modern days, May Day. The Biltan hold the spirit stone of Anath Lan. Anath Lan was once one of Biltan's Craftworld's most skilled farseers. Alas, pride caused him to misread the runes, dooming a maiden world to a bitter demise. Unable to forgive himself, Anath Lan died of grief, his spirit stone refused to bond with the infinity circuit, and guides other Eldars away from error to this day. Another notable Biotan Eldar is Avel Swifti, known as the Duke of Astari Reach. Avel Swifti leads a Corsair fleet out of Biotan, and continues Biotan's pledge to protect the Maiden Worlds from settlements by lesser races. Swifti has been known to display the greatest compassion to his defeated enemies, if it is pleasing to him to do so. On the world of Irthal, Avel destroyed half a dozen human settlements before the fleeting imperial colony surrendered. He took the surviving 40,000 colonists to a nearby habitable moon, keeping them in stasis aboard his ships, while they shuttled back and forth in short warp jumps, and promised that no further hostility would be taken against them if they did not stay back from Yrthral. Biotan places an unusual importance on the role of the warrior within their society, whereas in many craft worlds, the farseers hold sway over important decisions. On Biotan, a warrior council referred to as the court of the young king appears to be at least the equal of the farseers. This cadre reveres the idol of the Eldar war god, Kyla Mensha Kane, and have taken its name from the ceremony in which they awaken the avatar of Cain. A strong and dynamic political faction, it is often the court that makes the decision to go to war or negotiate as they see fit. Every member of the court is an aspect warrior, trapped in one particular path, unable to move to another path and gain new experiences. These exarchs, as they are known, are perhaps the most potent political force acting in Biotan, as well as its most deadly warriors. The exarchs are also the ones who designate the young king, who is ritually sacrificed on all Eldar craft worlds to awaken the raging spirit of the Avatar. The exarchs of the court are deadly hostile to all outsiders, as one might expect, and it is their influence which has produced the unusually aggressive and xenophobic culture of the Biltan craft world. It is speculated that the court is what drives the craft world to war over and over again. The Eldar way of war is very much akin to a child's puzzle. The Eldar army functions by dozens of mutually supporting elements combining, creating a dangerous and effective force. Each piece plays its own specific part. Notable Biotan campaigns include the Pyre of Kilakak Bane, when Imperial Xenologists begin to plunder the buried artifacts of the Eldar maiden world Kiliak, triggering a devastating response from the nearby Eldar craftworld of Biotan and Ulthwe. After a confirmed sighting of the Phoenix Lord, Jain Zar, and over a hundred Howling Banshee disciples, the Imperial interlopers are killed to a man, incinerated as their ashes scattered to the wind. Another large event was when Craftworld Baltan began a bloody war to reclaim the Maiden World of Rasilian from the encroaching humans. Their Eldar allies, the Yandin, judging that reclaiming the Rasilian brings no benefit in the ongoing wars against Chaos, refused to send aid. Even when two whole sector fleets and ten space marine chapters joined the fight, Biotan eventually emerged bloodied but victorious. Thereafter, the two craft worlds soon lost their unity of purpose, each assuming the other to be uncommitted to their alliance. The Battle of Aura Sepulchre 
is yet another defining event when an Eldar emissary from the Biltan craft world was sent to the Imperial world of Comrath to enter negotiations with the planetary governor for the return of an ancient Aldric artifact from the tomb of one of the Ultramarines most beloved heroes, Captain Orar, known as the Scepter of Galaxian. When the Imperial noble refused his request, the Eldar emissary grew angry and soon his pleas turned to threats of violence. The planetary governor refused to be threatened by the arrogant Xenos and had the Eldar executed on the spot. The governor had the foresight to heed the Eldar's threat and request aid from the Ultramarines. Eldar from the Alitok and Yandin Craftworld then proceeded to assault the planet of Comrath to recover the Eldar artifact. Orar was a great Ultramarine hero in the aftermath of the Horus Heresy. The chapter master Marnius Kalgar vowed not a single alien would breach the sanctity of his tomb. For the first time since the Battle of Macrag, Kalgar led his entire chapter to war. The Eldar descended upon the planet to find it held against them by the Ultramarines. Eldar aspect warriors and guardians darted towards the main gates of the great edifice that was Or's tomb, as grav tanks and artillery engines battered the Imperial defenders. On Kalgar's command, the Ultramarines emerged from cover and scoured the invaders from the steps within the tomb. With disciplined bolter volleys, the Eldars fell back, only to find their lines of retreat cut off by the assault marines and land speeders. Eldar leaders emerged from cover and rallied the trapped first wave, only to fall to sniper fire as the ultramarine scouts made their presence known. The initial Eldar assault faltered, but for an entire day and night they continued to attack. Though they mustered every arcane science at their command, they could not overcome the tactical brilliance of Marnius, Kalgar, and his ultramarines. The following day, a fresh assault swept onto the great stairs of the sepulchre, led by a colossal figure covered in flames, the Avatar of Cain, the Eldar, God of War. Heavy weapon fire seemed only to anger the creature, and the ultramarines' battle line buckled beneath its onslaught. Kalgar issued a challenge to himself. The fierce god bellowed with fury. Its first blow missed the ultramarine chapter master by a hair's breadth. The second tore plate from Kalgar's armor. The third bit deep into his shoulder, driving the chapter master to one knee. The fourth slammed into the armored palm of Kalgar's left hand. Rising up, Kalgar struck with all his strength, bringing his other gauntlet around in a mighty arc that punched clean through the molten iron of the Avatar's torso. With the fall of their war god, the Eldar lost all heart and retreated. Some fled without heed, while others fell back in good order, but all the Xenos retreated into the darkness. In his wisdom, Kalgar knew that the Eldar would return for the artifact. So it was he who informed Comrath's governor that the Kalzian Scepter would be removed from Orars and back to Macrag, where it could be properly defended. In another campaign, a vast imperial force comprising of the 52nd and the 124th Valhallen Imperial Guard regiments leads an invasion of the ice planet of Kalyan. To prevent a sacred Eldar temple of Aisha from falling into the hands of the Imperium, the craft world Bile Tan and Luganeth each field their most potent ghost warriors and aspect warriors in a unified force. Eventually the Eldar reach the temple and encircle it with ghost warriors, only for a war blizzard to bring new terrors in the form of a wave of demons. An uneasy alliance is struck between the Eldar and the Imperial forces to purge the planet of frost-blighted Slaneshi warp hordes. However, the Eldars have a great plan and lure the demons and Valhallans into a bloody conflict against each other. That greatly reduces the number of each. Though the Valhallans are finally victorious against the warp spawn, the ghost warriors easily destroy the exhausted Imperial survivors. The Bile Tan know of the horrors that Tyranids can be, and that is why they team up with the Eldars of Yandin 
and Dark Eldar forces to prevent the biological union of High Fleet Kraken and Leviathan upon the maiden world of Duriel. They are successful but Duriel itself is sacrificed to ensure victory through means of an arcane device known as the Fireheart. Encouraged by their success against the Tyranids at Duriel, the Eldar of Yandin and Baltan bring Fireheart to other worlds. They begin a campaign of planetary annihilation in order to starve High Fleet Leviathan as it advances. The two craft worlds then take part in the incineration of dozens of Imperial and Orc held worlds in and around the Ectorius Sector. By swiftly establishing beachheads and activating a modified version of the Psycho Doomsday device used to destroy the Tyranid infested planets of Duriel, the Eldar ensure that no shred of biomass is left. Countless worlds, many of them inhabited, are scoured clean of biomass in the ensuing campaign. Though the Imperium rages at the slaughter, blindly venting its wrath upon the Xeno spaceships within a dozen parcels, High Fleet Leviathan is denied crucial bio resources as a result. A short time after, a major part of the High Fleet is isolated and destroyed by interlacing Eldar attacks. Within the ranks of the Eldar of Baltan exists Macha. Macha is a powerful Eldar Farseer Psyker who has originally sealed a great demon in the chaos artifact called the Maledictum on the world of Tartarus. She later sought to prevent its unwitting release by the agents of mankind. Later events indicate that her destiny had become intertwined with that of Captain Gabriel Angelos of the Blood Ravens Space Marine Chapter. Another notable Biotan warrior is Marion. He is a militant Artarch who leads campaigns to purge non-Eldar presence off exodited worlds and maiden worlds. A former warrior of the Fire Dragon Aspect Shrine, Marion is filled with a burning rage and hatred of the lesser species that now inhabit these worlds. He has led many ruthless campaigns to purge these infestations of both orcs and humans. One of his greatest challenges came in the early 41st millennium during the Baron Wars, where the Artark managed to defeat both a detachment of Ravenguard Space Marines and an Orc Horde under Warboss Snag Snag. And those were 40 facts on the Eldar craft worlds. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, share it with your friends on Facebook, Reddit, whatever social media you guys use. It helps out the channel when you do so. Or support us on Patreon. It's just a dollar a month. And with that dollar, um, we do our giveaways. You still can participate in the giveaway, the Christmas or end of the year uh, subscriber appreciation giveaways where we are giving away the Sisters of Battle. If you check out our 40 facts on the organizations of the Sisters of Battle, you can still participate on that one. And then also the winner for the um, other uh, box set, uh, the starter set for the Gene Stealers. Uh, so if you check out our 40 facts on the Hive Cult, uh, you still have one more day to win um, that prize. So go over there and check those two videos out. I hope you guys enjoyed and um, talk to you tomorrow in the new year. This was Gersh1 with One Mind Syndicate signing out. Oh,